Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 7, part 2, the remaining bones of the skull. So we move on to the temporal bone. There are two of them, one on each side. If you look from at the bottom of the skull, you see that the temporal bone has two important foramen. You have the carotid foramen, where the carotid artery will go through, and the stylomastoid foramen. Looking on the side, you see that the temporal bone has a temporal squama right underneath the squ squama suture. It has a mandibular fossa, this depression that part of the mandible will fit into. It has the external auditory meatus, the mastoid portion, and the mastoid process. And then finally, the styloid process sticking out. Also, there is the zygomatic process that heads toward the zygomatic bone. Take the top of the skull off and look down. You see the temporal bone also has the petrous portion, where the inner workings of the ear will be. It has the internal auditory meatus. It has a groove for the sigmoid sinus. And you can see that the groove for the sigmoid sinus is actually continuous with that groove for the transverse dural sinus found in the acceptable bone. And the temporal bone forms the bulk of the middle cranial fossa. The sphenoid bone. There's one sphenoid bone. It is unique in that it articulates with all of the other cranial bones. The if you pop the top of the skull off and look down, you see that the sphenoid bone has this large area that I have boxed in that's referred to as the cella tersica. And in the middle of the cella tersica is the hypophysial fossa, or depression. Also within the cella tersica, you see is the optic foramen, there's one on each side. There's also the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, one on each side. The uh, greater wing, again, one on each side. And then the body of the sphenoid bone. Some people say the sphenoid bone looks kind of like a butterfly or a bat from this view. Some other foramen or holes found in the sphenoid bone include the foramen rotundum the foramen oval, the foramen spinosum, and the foramen lacerum. They form sort of a, a triangular shape if you connected all the dots. If you look at the bottom of the skull, you see hanging down from it is the pterygoid process. There are two of these for the spinoid bone. Here they are also, if you look at the bone by itself. And then if you look at the front of the skull, you can see the sphenoid bone is in the back of the cavity of the orbits. And there is a fissure, the superior orbital fissure. Now I move on to the ethmoid bone, which is slightly anterior to the sphenoid bone. It's rather an odd-shaped little guy. It has the cristagalli, which sort of sticks up on the sides forming part of the um, orbits is the lateral mass. Also has the perpendicular plates sticking down into the nasal cavity that forms uh, part of the nasal septum. Looking at the side view, you see that the um, foramen has what's referred to as the cribriform plate that forms part of the roof of the orbital cavity or the floor of the anterior fossa. And within that cribriform plate are lots of tiny little holes, referred to as the olfactory foramina, where the uh, olfactory uh, nerves will pass through. Also looking at the side view, you see that the ethmoid bone also has a superior nasal concha and a middle nasal concha. These protrude out of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. 
A nasal bone. There are two nasal bones. One and two. The vomer bone. The vomer bone is the bone that forms the posterior, uh, not posterior, inferior portion of the nasal septum. It articulates with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. You have two inferior nasal conchi, one on each lateral wall of the nasal cavity. You have two lacrimal bones that form part of the uh, medial wall of the orbits. The lacrimal bones also have a lacrimal fossa, or depression. And that leads to the lacrimal foramen, which is a hole that will then lead via a duct down into the nasal cavity. So again, when you form tears, some of those tears are going to end up in your nasal cavity. Zygomatic bones. We have one on each side. It forms the cheeks, basically. See, the zygomatic bone has a temporal process. That temporal process will articulate with the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Together, these two processes form the zygomatic arch. So again, the zygomatic bone has a temporal process that articulates with the temporal bone. With the temporal bone's zygomatic process and the zygomatic bone's temporal process, you get a bigger structure called the zygomatic arch. The palatine bones, we have two of these. They're sort of L-shaped with a perpendicular portion forming part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and a horizontal portion that forms the back or posterior portion of the hard palate as well as the floor of the nasal cavity. And also it got a little tiny, tiny bit that goes into the orbits. The two maxilla bones. They are in the front and they hold our top row of teeth. So looking at a maxilla bone, you see that it has an infraorbital foramen, so it's below the orbit. It has an inferior anterior nasal spine, so there's a little point sticking out. And then it has the alveolar process, or alveolar margin, just the edge here, where the teeth are going to be entering. Now, if you take a look at where the teeth enter, those are referred to as the alveolar sockets. So the maxilla bone has alveolar sockets that the teeth will fit into. It also forms part of the inferior orbital fissure up in the orbits. And it also has a lacrimal fossa, so it has a slight depression near the lacrimal bone, again as a way to get tears to eventually reach your nasal cavity. If you look at the bottom of the maxilla bones, you see that it has a incisive fossa, or foramen. So it's either depression or an actual hole. And also it has what's called the palatine process, which is basically the superior portion of the hard palate. The mandible. It is the one bone in the skull that is naturally movable. It has a number of features. It has the condylar process that is going to articulate with the temporal bone. That's where the joint is that allows the jaw to open and close. It has a mandibular notch. This big portion of the mandible is referred to as the mandibular ramus. It has a mandibular angle, and then leading to the mandibular body, which is the bulk of the mandible. Also notice that there is a little bitty mental foramen, or hole, in the mandible. Then along the edge, where the teeth are, is the alveolar process, or you could call it the alveolar margin. And where the teeth actually insert into the mandible is referred to as the alveolar sockets. Now, if you look on the other side, you can see that on the inside is the mandibular foramen. And also, before I forget to mention it, is the coronoid process. So if you think about it, you go from the condylar process to the mandibular notch to the coronoid process. 
And that is that for this portion of the lecture.